Welcome, Greek U Nation, to episode number 480 of the Fraternity Foodie Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Ayalon, CEO of Greek University. I'm a speaker and an author. Our fifth book just came out. It's called Perseverance and How to Be a Great Fraternity or Sorority Alumnus. So I want you to go and pick up that book on Amazon or Barnes & Noble today. We call these episodes the Fraternity Foodie Podcast because there is nothing like great food to bring fraternity and sorority leaders together. Fun fact, I love traveling around the country and all over the world. I've been to places like Jamaica, Bermuda, Bahamas, Israel, Canada, the Netherlands, and Sweden. Then last night, I'm on TikTok, and I see a great deal for a seven-night Mediterranean cruise with Celestial Cruises for less than a 1000 bucks. Of course, I had to show that to my wife. And it's our next guest bringing incredible deals to the public on her social media account. Now, this person works incredibly hard in her niche. She is a member of an incredible sorority, DeFi-E, and I can't wait to introduce her to the entire fraternity and sorority community today, all of our listeners. So as the founder of Jen on a Jet Plane LLC, Jen Ruiz creates and shares content that inspires and empowers students to travel more and turn their passion into a business. Jen is a three-time TEDx speaker, a six-time best-selling author, and a six-time national award-winning writer. She's got over 10 years of experience in this field. She's built a loyal and engaged audience of more than 375,000 travelers. She has been featured in Forbes, The Washington Post, ABC News, and other media outlets. Jen leverages her skills in public speaking, blogging, and travel writing to partner with global brands and destinations such as Airbnb, Samsonite, Audible, Meta, and Viking Cruises. Jen's social media content has garnered more than 100 million views, and her new memoir, it's called 12 Trips in 12 Months, tells the story of how she quit her job as a lawyer after visiting 41 cities across 11 countries in one year. It is a Library Reads top new release for June of 2024. Welcome to the show, Jen. Thanks for having me, Mike. Hey, it is my pleasure. It is an honor to have you on the show. I am a big believer in you. I think you're an absolute incredible person. And uh, I'm just super excited to get this opportunity to share you with all of our listeners. So thank you for being here. <laughs> I'm excited to be here. All right, let's do it. So, you know, I love talking about where all of this started. And ultimately, you decided on Florida International University for your undergraduate experience. Tell our audience, why was FIU your choice? Well, I grew up in Philadelphia, so I always dreamed of going to a sunny destination for college, right? I think we all do. It's near the beach. Uh, and so Miami was really high on my list. But University of Miami was the one that I knew of from afar. And FIU got my attention with a full scholarship, which was very tempting. And also, I enjoyed that the campus was newer. So I think it wasn't as established or as old of a school as University of Miami, like as well known. But but it had so many things going for it. And when my mom and me visited, my mom and I visited, she in insisted that this was the place for me. She was like, I see so much growth potential here for you. And she was right. It really was the right decision in every sense of the word. It was wonderful to leave debt free, but also with that school being, you know, only 30 years old or so at the time that I attended, there was so much opportunity to get involved, to join Greek life, to join student government, and to make that university experience so much more beyond just going to class. Yeah, that is a great institution. Our speakers love speaking at FIU. Uh, just a really, really incredible place. And hey, no debt and you're going to school in Miami. I mean, it doesn't really get much better than that. Let's be honest. No brainer. <laughs> <laughs> So you joined Delta Phi Epsilon while you were there, DeFi-E, one of my favorite sororities. Some of my favorite friends are all DeFi-E's. So what made you want to join them over some of the other groups on campus? I think it was a little bit different for me going through recruitment because I didn't have any background on the sororities. I didn't know anybody in there. And in Miami, you do have a little bit of a you know, history in terms of schools and private schools and, you know, people that know each other for years. And I just came in completely unaware of any of that. So I was like, this already seems fun. This already seems nice. Um, DeFi for me caught my attention, one, because they were all genuine. 
-hmm. They were very diverse mm -hmm. and they had theme nights that really, you know, drew to certain things in me. Like for instance, they had Dr. Seuss and Oh, the Places You'll Go night, which was so wonderful. And really, I think appealed to that early wanderlust in me. And then also they had a uh, DeFi song variation of Buttercup. So they had a dessert theme night and I love sweets. So I just really enjoyed my time going through the recruitment process, getting to know the people in the sorority. And ultimately, I think that also was the right place for me. It definitely is the right place for you. There's no question about it. I love the diversity that you saw in the organization. And we'll certainly talk more about that and how others can mimic that in their own organization, because I think it's important. I think it made them a better organization then and today. Um, and they're just a very progressive organization nationally. So I just have a lot of respect for that. I think it's it's really bold, you know, the way that they operate and uh, that conviction in who they are for me is everything. Um, and so, you know, great organization. I can't say enough uh, good stuff about that. And uh, Nicole DeFeo, the, uh, the CEO, she's an absolute dynamo. So uh, it makes total sense that you joined DeFi-E to me. Um, and so that's fantastic. <laughs> I, I did. I wanted to just note that also along those lines, you know, Alpha Gamma chapter, the chapter that I was in at FIU mm -hmm. has won the national award, you know, at convention, the international award for best chapter multiple times. So it was a phenomenal chapter to be part of with over a hundred active members, so many amazing women that I still keep in touch with today that have gone on to join the organization and work for the organization. That's how involved they are. So it really was, I think, even among DeFi-E, really one of the exceptional DeFi-E chapters and such a wonderful Greek experience because of that. Yeah. That is really nice. Uh, you landed in the right place. So everything worked out. Uh, no question about that. And so after that, now you go to the University of Maryland to get your law degree. So what made it, what motivated you to dedicate this early part of your life to law? What was the pull to law? Well, when I was at DeFi, I was um, at college. I wanted to run for student government and I was originally a communications major and that was on another campus. So I had to switch my major if I was going to stay active and, you know, be in the sorority and student government and all those things. And poli sci seemed like the right choice at the time. I think I have always been drawn to the same storytelling thread. And I didn't know it at the time, thinking that law was the natural prestigious way to pursue this interest that I had in writing and reading and telling other people's stories and being an advocate for people. And it's what I don't think people realize now is that common thread and why I don't think it was that big of a switch to go from law to travel blogging, because I still am telling those stories just instead of, you know, standing in front of a jury and telling you, you know, my story is going to be the most compelling one that you hear here today. By the time I'm done, you're going to believe everything I've said, basically. Um, now I get to write stories and say, you know, this is a business that you need to know about, a destination you weren't aware of, a unique experience in this location that you need to know about. So it really is that same storytelling. And that's been the passion that I've had forever. Um, since I was a very avid reader, I used to get pulled out of school early to go into um, advanced reading classes, like mentally gifted classes. And I was the nerd who was like, yeah, totally. I would love to read Little Women, like in first grade and discuss it in depth in a special class. Like that sounds amazing. Um, so that's just been to this day, uh, really the thread that has carried me through my career and poli sci was a great place to nurture that and to gain that really prestigious background. I don't regret being a lawyer. It's so wonderful now to still have that credential, to be able to fall back on my own knowledge and experience and, you know, law degree and two bar exams that I've passed. That's all really wonderful tools in my arsenal, especially as an entrepreneur, especially as somebody navigating the world solo. Uh, I feel very grateful for all of it. Yeah. Now I understand why you became a lawyer and then eventually you made that switch to travel. And so all of that makes a lot of sense to me. And, you know, you're really just using all the tools that you received in college in order to be a better entrepreneur. I've done the same thing. I have an accounting degree. Nobody ever believes me when I say that I was an accountant once upon once upon a time doing debits and credits. <laughs> They're like, how is that? Like, Mike, that's not you. And I know that now. <laughs> like, now I know clearly that wasn't for me. But you know, using all of those skills to be an effective entrepreneur, to understand a balance sheet and income statement and how to make my business profitable without having to go to an outside accountant to do my personal taxes or the business taxes. 
That was all really, really important. That's what makes me successful at who I am because I really am a businessman at my core, but I have this creative part of me that loves to create new presentations and engage with people. So, um, so you just use all those tools as you go and you've done the same, which I think is fantastic. Um, now I'm, you know, a little bit jealous in that you are really taking something that you're super passionate about and you are making a lot of profits with it. I think that is fantastic. I, you know, I'm trying to do the same as well as a speaker. I think that's ultimately what I'm passionate about. And I'm turning that into a big business. And I'm sure a lot of our students who are listening, they want to do the same with whatever they're passionate about. So how can a college student take whatever they're passionate about and then turn that into a side hustle while they're in college or even a full-time career? Well, I think so many college students go now into thinking that influencer is actually their dream job, right? That it's something that they aspire to be without really realizing that it can be lucrative and it can be a way to extend your professional expertise that you gain in college. It doesn't have to be, you know, influencer or it can be everything that you learn in college that you refine. That can be something that you're broadcasting and, and marketing online because media has changed where our attention resides has changed. We are on our phones. We are on our laptops. You know, it's very rare that you go to a cafe and see somebody reading a newspaper, like a physical newspaper nowadays. And we're seeing that change in the media landscape as well with, you know, National Geographic switch to being digital first and having social media be a strong way for them to portray that same content, but through a different lens in a way that's going to be absorbed by where people's eyes are in the moment. So if you're somebody who's in college and you have a skill set like I don't know, comedy. You're taking these amazing acting classes. You're actually really funny. Um, this is a skill set that you can share and that you can market and make yourself now a personal brand and somebody that brands are going to reach out to to be an ambassador for them. Uh, and you can start having partnerships and getting paid to create this content because it's a talent that you have naturally. And this applies across a broad spectrum of things. If you're a scientist, you have a scientific mind, you like seeing everything in charts and numbers and experiments, you can have a channel where you're explaining the things that you're learning or that you're finding. If you are somebody that enjoys knitting or creating or fashion, right, or styling things, you know, it's not just a fun video of you making transitions. It's actually a way of you to showcase what you know in a way that the normal public doesn't. And that allows you to build subject matter expertise a loyal, warm audience, and the ability to have a brand and a reputation that precedes you so that people want to work with you. I love it. Great answer there. Really good stuff. The other thing that I've noticed about you is that you've been able to build rapport and build relationships with other people all over the planet. This is like your superpower. And instinctively, we probably want to be around people that are just like us. I think that's just the way that we're built, that we want people from the same hometown. We want people that look like us, that talk like us, that have the same interests. But if a sorority or a fraternity is listening now and they want to recruit a more diverse population, which is what we have on college campuses today, how do they execute a plan to meet more people and recruit more people who are actually different from them? Right. I think diversity is so important, particularly when it comes to sororities, because People want to be somewhere where they feel welcome. This is a sisterhood. This is something where you're asking people to be vulnerable. You're asking them to spend a lot of time with you and nobody wants to feel like there isn't space for them there. And ultimately too, as a sorority, you are at your best stage when everybody wants to join you and you have your pick of the people that you can extend an offer to. So you want to be known as a kind, inclusive sorority that people feel at home in. And the way to do that is not to alienate others, but to build connections, to build bridges wherever you can. And it can be difficult where you don't necessarily see immediate, you know, perceived similarities or likenesses that you can bond over. But I've been able to have a conversation with, you know, uh, a lady in Greece who was 80 years old and didn't speak a lick of English. And somehow in that, you know, between sign language and, you know, just good smiling and vibes, we were able to connect and we were able to somehow in, in actually translate a message between us that when her daughter showed up verified, we had it pretty much on point. There are so many universal connectors from smiling to inquisitiveness 
you know, being curious about somebody as opposed to being judgmental or fearful, really wanting to learn about people, really wanting to, um, you know, sh showcase what they have to show you. That's why I do such a, um, that's why I make friends all over the world. Because everywhere I go, I ask for them to tell me their story. And I listen attentively, not with judgment, but actually wanting to learn what it is that they have to share and appreciating that difference. So I think in a sorority setting uh, and in the Greek life setting in general, you do so much better and your organization is redeemed in such a higher regard when you can lean towards inclusivity and really wanting to understand people instead of, you know, grouping, grouping and alienating people. Great message. Really good stuff. We should talk about your new book too, because you received the book deal for your memoir. It's called 12 Trips in 12 Months about defying societal expectations of what a woman should be by age 30 as told through a year long travel challenge. So how can the college students who are listening in fraternities or sororities use challenges in order to motivate their chapter and accomplish their mutual goals? A challenge is so powerful. If you think about it, when people set out to lose weight or something, you know, they go, I want to do the 75 day challenge. There's a lot of powerful things about a challenge that make it different than just setting a goal in general. Like when people go into a new year, they set resolutions. It doesn't feel like it ever has an end date. So maybe after the first month or so, you start to get this illusion. You're not seeing the progress that you want and you just let those goals fall to the wayside. A challenge is different because it's concentrated effort for a set period of time. There's an end time in mind. So it doesn't feel like this forever goal that you have. And if you do it right by the end of that challenge, you will see that immediate result that you are looking for because you will have completed what you set out to do. And that completion in and of itself feels really good. And so for organizations that maybe want to level up in some way, that want to reach a goal that can seem a little bit out of reach, that want to motivate and organize their members to work together towards a common goal, I think a challenge is the secret because it allows you to have that public accountability within each other. Everybody's motivated to work together for this. And it's going to end. So your increased efforts are not going to be limitless, right? You feel like you can put in this increased effort for that little bit of time. That's how I ran the half marathon at Disney, because let me tell you, if I had to think that I'm just going to constantly be at the running 10 to 13 miles on average, like I just would have felt so disheartened from the get-go. But knowing that no matter what, you know, on this date, it's going to be over, knowing that I'm going to have this incremental, easily accessible progress. I think that that's the key to making these changes and actually frog leaping yourself from one reality into another. I love it. What a great uh, tool for our college students to use to accomplish goals that they might think is ordinarily impossible, uh, but you've set it up in such a way that they can actually do it. I think that's fantastic. Uh, you know, the other thing too is Hispanic Heritage Month is right around the corner, September 15th through October 15th. So how can students educate other students on campus about Hispanic Heritage Month so that we, we can all celebrate Latino and Hispanic culture? I had the pleasure of authoring portions of the Voters 2023 Guidebook to Puerto Rico, and I've submitted chapters to uh, Lonely Planet Offbeat about Puerto Rico, and I visited Spanish-speaking locations around the world. So I've seen so many diverse aspects of Latinidad, of the Hispanic community, mm -hmm. really from all of my travels, from Basque Country in Spain, where they have a language there that, you know, they don't even speak Spanish, but they're still very much part of this Spanish culture and a lot of things from Spain and, and the tapas, um, you know, the standing tables, the mm -hmm. rowing, all of those things have come from these traditions that have melted together. Same thing with Puerto Rico, that's a blend of, you know, Taino culture and uh, Spanish culture and African American culture as well. And so there's so many different ways to appreciate Hispanic countries and so many ways that we can share wonders around the world that people can embrace and actually be proud of uh, and, and see that there's a shared Hispanic community that should be lauded and should be elevated instead of looked on, you know, like sometimes I think it can be, you, you can sometimes use it in a derogatory way of, you know, immigrants in a derogatory way of these people maybe shouldn't be here. And I think if we celebrate 
these the diversity between us if we celebrate how much it adds for us to know that these places exist to have these people here to be able to make their their cultures stronger because it makes us stronger as a whole to integrate it i think we're seeing that now with the olympics right mm -hmm. we're seeing how much of our team is made up of these diverse people from all of these different places and they've made us stronger at the u.s we have the best of everyone um and so i think if you look at it that way not that these uh, people are detracting from the fabric of our society, but they're adding all of this richness to the fabric of our society. And mm -hmm. I think that's a celebration that can extend well beyond Hispanic Heritage Month. I love it. I absolutely love it. You really said it very, very well. No question about it, that it is adding to our culture on college campuses in the United States and all over the world. And you get to see a little bit of that with the Olympics, uh, which is really cool to see. Now, you have a huge social media following. I mean, you have 375,000 social media followers. Uh, what advice can you give our fraternities and sororities who are trying to build a similar following for their student organization, whether it be on Instagram or on TikTok? I have seen so many people succeed in sharing college content. I think one, give your members a chance to create content, like give them the, the chance to run with it. If somebody has a video idea, why not? See it, see what sticks. Because first, you never know what's going to go viral. You can never predict virality. Mm -hmm. And so let people try new ideas. Don't be so rigid, like see, give them a chance. I've seen somebody hop on a trend. So trending, you know, variations of a particular sound, a particular type of transition that you make to reflect your sorority or fraternity and your organization, your philanthropy or your mission, that's a great way to hop on something that people already recognize. Um, like there's the sarcastic trend recently, like uh, I'm in my 40s. Of course, I go to sleep by 9 p.m. Like that kind of thing. Right. Like so something like I'm in a fraternity or sorority. Like, of course, we support three philanthropies every year. Like I'm in a fraternity and sorority, like that kind of switching the trend to incorporate what you do in a way that shines positive light on your organization and highlights your accomplishments. I think that's the best way to do it. And then taking advantage of wherever the attention is at the time, because I can't tell you that, you know, it's going to be TikTok now and TikTok forever. These platforms really change. Mm. As of the time I'm speaking, Threads is actually a great place to be for like text-based content. I've had my content get more than 10 million views there um, because I found something that really took off. So I recommend experimenting with new platforms, letting your members submit new ideas, try something new because it could just go viral. When something does go viral, maximize that viral moment by replying to the top comments with other videos. So that traction from that initial video automatically translates to the next. See if you can make a series out of that that you know was so popular with people. So double down and do more of it. And ultimately keep experimenting because social always keeps changing. And the important thing is that you're highlighting your message, your causes, your members through all of these different platforms. I love it. That is great advice from somebody who is a master at it. So really, really great stuff. Go back and listen to that. There are a lot of gems in there. And I agree with you. We can't even predict what's going to be viral at all. So just let your members experiment, see what works and what doesn't work. Sometimes like the worst content, something that I'm like, oh, this is like a total throwaway video goes viral. And I'm like, how did that happen? Yeah. Like, this is the last video I would have thought that would have went viral. Exactly. <laughs> it. <laughs> it's just, it's the one that you don't expect. So like, if you have expectations, throw it out the window and start experimenting. That's the best advice I can give you. <laughs> yes, that's why you need to have that little bit of element of flexibility and letting people try something new. Because mm -hmm. if you're super rich, and you're always sticking to the set template or format, your audience gets bored and you never know what's going to be a hit. So just go ahead and try it. As long as it, you know, fits within your brand guidelines is, is highlighting you in a positive light. Isn't anything that's like super, even the sarcastic one that I mentioned, you can do that in a way that still highlights, you know, really great things about you. So I think as long as your brand messaging is on point, try something new. I'm with you. Absolutely. And go and check out Jen's social media account and you will get a master class in what works. So really, really great job. Now we love good food here at the Fraternity Foodie Podcast. And I sense that you are a bit of a foodie yourself as well. So we have that in common. Where should I go for a great meal in Florida these days? Florida's 
so general uh and so and there's so many iconic meals in florida like you can get key lime pie and, and key west kind of thing if i'm gonna go with my tendencies because and you know just to shout out the hispanic community as well i do recommend you go on a hunt for the best croquetas in miami okay. so a croqueta is a cuban fried pastry appetizer thing and it has like a like a meat like ham and cheese inside usually but they have variations of it mm -hmm. and so they vary in terms of the crispness it's uh they vary in terms of how stuffed they are how they blend the stuffing and as a connoisseur you can go to the different places and be like oh yes this one has a perfect crunch and split oh yes this one seems like it has a really nice chewiness and you can compare and contrast from all the different bakeries and go on a croqueta tasting tour of the city Okay, I am down. I am down for the tasting tour. I will see you in Miami and we will make that happen because that sounds absolutely delicious. And yes, I have a sweet tooth as well. It's probably not great for me, but it is what it is and I love it. So there you go. <laughs> if we're talking sweet tooth, I'm going to quickly shout out Jackson's in Fort Lauderdale. It is a crazy ice cream spot. They literally have a kitchen sink that they bring out and they fill it with ice cream and it's called the kitchen sink and it's like a 40 people ice cream communal <laughs> thing that you can try to eat. Um, it's really nuts, but they also have vintage candy and it's really like cool decorations and license plates and stuff. So if you want a fun sweet tooth place, Jackson's, and it's with an X, J-A-X-S-O-N apostrophe S. Jackson's ice cream. I am there. You don't have to ask me twice for ice cream. All right. You really don't. <laughs> Twist my arm. I'll go. All right. All of this sounds amazing. I'm definitely going to go and check out all of the spots. So if our listeners, if they want to watch your TEDx talks, they want to buy your books, if they want to bring you in to come and speak on their college campus, where should they be going to connect with you? My main hub online is jenonajetplane.com. Uh, that has my TEDx talks, my books, all of my travels, uh, and information about my talks and more information about how you can work with me. That is fantastic. Jenonajetplane.com. Go and check it out. I tell you what, you will not be disappointed. Her TEDx talks are absolutely amazing. Um, all of her social media is just all on point. It's all on brand. If you go and check it out, you will definitely see what I'm talking about. Definitely worth a follow because she's got incredible content all over the place. Uh, no matter what she does, it's first class every single time. So Jen, thank you so much for being here on the show and sharing all of this great information with us today. Thank you for having me, Mike. It is my pleasure. And to our listeners, if you enjoy this talk with Jen, I want you to like it on social media and I want you to share it with other college students that are also trying to turn their passions into profits. And we look forward to seeing you on the next episode of the Fraternity Foodie Podcast. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.